I'm John O'Farrell. I was the executive officer of the Sacramento Local Agency Formation Commission for 25 years from uh, 1976 to 2002. And I was actively involved with and managed much of the Citrus Heights Incorporation project uh, on behalf of the Sacramento LAFCO. So these are the, this is the county administration building. It was constructed in 1978. The, uh, actually, the Citrus Heights Incorporation uh, began about that time, but really did get into full swing until the, the late 1980s. As we come forward, we're going to see the Board of Supervisors chambers. Uh, they have changed significantly since I was here last year in 2002. But essentially, it's the same layout with, uh, with the board sitting uh, up in the front behind a, uh, you know, a large uh, uh, area with, with uh, um, well, you're going to see 15 seats there, but typically there are only five seats there. They hold a number of different meetings in here. So this meeting, I believe, is for the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District. So shall we keep, keep move forward? Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. So again, by way of background, I was a LAFCO executive officer, and I was also for much of much of my at the end of my career as a deputy county executive. So I spent a lot of time in these chambers either uh, advising LAFCO, the seven member body that uh, actually was deliberating, deliberating on the Citrus Heights Incorporation for the 10 year period that we had an active petition and filing. Uh, but I was also down here once or twice every week as Deputy County Executive advising the Board of Supervisors on a number of different programs and policies that I was involved with. Typically, staff would sit up um, as we're facing the, the, the board uh, on the left-hand side. In the back in the day, we didn't have the electronic, uh, all the electronic uh, equipment and uh, ability to display things. Uh, on screens it was paper maps and paper reports and um, literally the, the documents were huge, uh, many, 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 many volumes of paper. The maps were very, very large, sometimes four by four. Maps would be all over the front, on the sides, sometimes in the back. Uh, the board chambers, I think, as I recall, they seat, it seats something like 200 to 250 people. Uh, typically, if we had a a hearing, this would be full, and there'd be people standing in the back, and the hearings would last anywhere from two hours to six or seven hours. Coming down the steps, this is my seat right here. I think I wore out three or four chairs over the period of you know, 25 or 30 years sitting here. Uh, my staff sat here to support me and uh, they were typically you know, as involved with the project as I was, but as the executive officer, I was responsible typically for leading off the presentations and walking the, the commission at the time or as deputy county executive, the board of supervisors members, uh, what, what the issue was. Um, how we analyzed the problem, what the recommendation was, and how to move forward from that point on. So I was here, Paul Hahn was the assistant executive officer, Peter Brundage was a staff analyst. The commission clerk who recorded the proceedings initially uh, with a tape recorder and took uh, uh, shorthand. Um, many people probably don't even know what shorthand is. But uh, she recorded the meetings and preserved uh, the, the meeting notes and the resolutions for posterity. The, the LAFCO offices have all those files. Some of them have been archived. The lawyer for uh, LAFCO also sat over there. She advised the, 
or for the you know county board of supervisors, county council, advise the um, the board, the staff, uh, the audience on different legal issues and what state law was at the time governing the different kinds of actions that were coming forward. Testimony would be typically taken right here at this podium and people would address the board and they had uh, an opportunity to speak on behalf of uh, whatever they were interested in, whether if they were opposed to a project, supported the project. Uh, normally, the, the, they would be a, a chief speaker who was given some latitude with respect to time, but typically anybody else that wanted to speak after that would have three or four minutes or five minutes at best because some of the as I mentioned, as we came in here, there could be 200 people in here, and if you had everybody speaking for 10 minutes, you'd be here half the night. And one night, we were here actually until 2.30 in the morning. So the commission consisted of seven individuals, two county supervisors appointed by the county supervisors, two city council people appointed from the then four cities, Sacramento City, Folsom, Isleton, and Galt. Two, two special district representatives appointed from roughly 100 different special districts, park districts, fire districts, cemetery districts, water di districts, reclamation districts, and so on and so forth. LAFCO, uh, the body LAFCO, the seven members are the ones that actually made recommendation, not made recommendations, but actually made the decision to move forward. And the, the way that they did that is they listened to the staff analysis and presentation and recommendations. They took testimony from the audience. They had deliberations among themselves. They may have asked county council or LAFCO council questions about you know, the, the state law, the legality of what was happening. Um, and then uh, they were given the opportunity to, to make a, a decision. Well, that process, as we spoke of the other day, that process took 10 years. So there were at least 25 hearings in this room by LAFCO itself. There are probably another 30, maybe even 40 hearings by the Board of Supervisors, and a lot of different meetings in between. Um, a, an issue like this in probably any other county in the state at the time might have taken at best a year, maybe even less than a year, but this took 10 years. Uh, hearings, uh, challenges in court, uh, a, uh, a rocky path through the state legislature to change legislation, um, and actually all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court on one constitutional issue involving voting rights. Um, in the early days, there was no Metro 14 cable. In the later days, uh, we actually had all of our hearings. They were uh, televised on uh, Metro 14. So I'm sure that if, if I went back in the archives and I saw some of those hearings, I'd probably have nightmares again. But uh, it was another way to preserve uh, part of the record about what happened. It was actually very helpful to the public those that couldn't attend these hearings, that they could at least pick up what was going on on uh, Metro 14. Uh, and again, no nothing was electronic. Um, paper maps, paper reports. Um, yeah, uh, it was... Uh, specific memories in here that you could tell, like, uh, Bill like, and Duber sat right here and argued this right here or said this or... Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, this, so the, you know, the, the CHIP, the Citrusites Incorporation Project, had a number of members over the, the you know, the uh, probably the 20 long or 20 year decade that this was going on from the late 70s all the way into 1996. So various members of the Citrusites uh, Incorporation Project, uh, they would come before the, either the Board of Supervisors or LAFCO and speak right from right here where we're standing right now. And Bill Van Duker, Jeannie Bruins, uh, Doug Osi, Roberta McGlashan, um, David Hurst, lawyer for the CHIPS project, and many others. I mean, I, I can't even begin to recall how many people were involved. But over, uh, when, you, when you look at a project that has a life of 20 years, 
you have people that come on with a lot of enthusiasm, and then you have people that drop off, you know, they move, they, you know, things happen, uh, and then another group comes in. Uh, what is interesting about Citrus Heights is that, and, and the others, at least one other community was like, actually two other communities were like that that did incorporate. Rancho Cotto was the same way, and so was Elk Grove. They had a transition in leadership and uh, speakers and supporters, but the spirit was always there to move forward with, uh, you know, with the, the, the goal, the vision of creating their own cities. Um, the board chambers could get raucous and noisy, uh, especially if uh, LAFCO or the Board of Supervisors did something that um, the supporters or the opponents uh, didn't like, and the, the chair of the commission or the board had to maintain order. Uh, we had, early on in the process, we had no security here. Um, after we had our bomb scare and we had uh, some other issues, we always had security present, and that was somebody, f a deputy sheriff from the sheriff's office that was here. Um, and what was the bomb scare? Was that because of the situation, or was it? Don't know. No, th don't know. Never, never really did find out, but we were evacuated, and you know, not late in the night, one night, when the, the hearing was occurring. Um, and in the day uh, when we started this, of course, there were no cell phones. It was landlines exclusively. So for those of us that were down here late at night um, and we had families, you know, our families were wondering, okay, um, when is he or she going to be home? How late is the hearing going to last? When Metro Cable 14 began to televise the proceedings, then it was easier to track who was here and who wasn't here. So it, it served a dual purpose, at least for me. Uh, as I say, one night I was here, the hearing ended about one o'clock, and I was here until 2.30, maybe 3.30 in the morning, um, developing a report for a hearing the next day. At one point during the, the most contentious part of the process, um, I think I had mentioned in our interview the other day that I had acquired something like 240 hours of overtime in a year. Um, just being down here late at night and going to meetings and doing things in the community as well. Um, fond memories for uh, this, this building, this office. Um, I spent much of my professional career right here at you know, one of these chairs. And in terms of the number of LAFCO hearings that I uh, presided over in my 25 years, probably number in uh, at least 300, maybe 350. In terms of the time I spent in front of the Board of Supervisors from 1970 to, to 2004, uh, several thousand hearings and multiple thousand hours right here. So a better part of my life actually Right now, exactly half my life was, was spent in here professionally. Um, yeah, this, uh, this building, uh, it, has a, it has a huge history and a lot of sig significant uh, policy changes in terms of how Sacramento County does business because of the incorporation of citrus sites in Elk Grove and Rancho Cordova uh, has made a difference in, in the lives of a number of people. Um, some would argue that those incorporations were detrimental to Sacramento County. Um, I don't really believe that to be true, but uh, there still may be that feeling from some folks. Um, but what it did do at the time was it allowed the people in those communities to have their own autonomy, self-determination, and make, make their own decisions based upon their community's needs and you know, what, what their desires were. Within that meeting notice, there is an agenda for what the subject matter is that for the Board of Supervisors, the City Council, the Special District Board, that they're going to consider and possibly act on. If it is an action item, it will show up as an action item where there will be a request for the presiding body to make a decision. Sometimes it's simply a report, uh, no action item. Um, but. Uh, in terms of how that then unfolds, once you go to the meeting and the hearing, uh, the 
the chair person of the body, the Board of Supervisors, City Council, Special District, LAFCO, or other group, would call the meeting to order and take roll and then ask whoever the chief executive officer was, the county executive, the city manager, the LAFCO executive officer, the general manager of the special district, to go ahead and begin with uh, the, the, the agenda items and uh, present what the items are or were, um, make a, you know, make a, not just describe it just generally and globally and then get into the detail and what the issue is and then uh, make a recommendation on how to move forward. The, the, uh, the presiding body would have the opportunity to ask whoever with the, the presenter might have been. It could be, again, the, you know, the chief executive officer or one of the principal staff people. Um, and then they would say, All right, is there any testimony? Does there, anybody want to speak to the issue? And if there were a lot of people, they would have the people sign up. And if there were a super large number of people, they'd say, okay, everybody sign up and you're each gonna get th uh, three minutes or whatever the number is. And please don't repeat what the prior speaker has said. If it's new information, um, certainly we'd like to hear that. But if you agree with the prior speaker, simply we, uh, we agree with that position. And then uh, once the testimony was completed, the board, would, the, the board, the commission would close the public hearing and they would have deliberations among themselves, may ask a couple of more questions of staff, and then somebody would make a motion to, to either approve or disapprove. And then the, the, the clerk, the commission clerk, or the, the board secretary would actually call the roll. And some to, in, in the day, it was a, it was a uh, voice vote. Today, you've got, your little, you've got your little pad that you hit, and the X shows up right there. So, uh, and then that, I, that item would be concluded, and then they move on to the next. And if you had a large agenda, like a typical board meeting, board of supervisors meeting in the day, when I was here, would start at nine in the morning and sometimes go to three in the afternoon. Uh, LAFCO hearing would typically start at six, and uh, if it was a light agenda, it would be over by 8.30 or nine. If it was a heavier agenda or controversial, as all the incorporations were and some of the fire district organizations were, it could last four or five hours, or in some cases, eight hours. So it was a long night, and yeah. So all the seats would be filled and people would be standing along the back walls sometimes and actually once we had the capacity of um, uh, Metro 14 they would actually put screens out in the back and you could actually stand out in the uh, you know the little anteroom out in front and uh, you could watch the proceedings as well I mean that if you know if, if there'd only been you know 20 people in here they would have known that this was this didn't have a lot of a large you know a large community support behind it but the fact that it went on for 20 years and in the last 10 years when we actually had an active petition that's when there was there were always a number of people here and even see the LAFCO hearings were in the evening board of supervisors meetings were during the days typically occasionally they'd have a night meeting but people would even come to the day meetings of the board of supervisors they take time off work or you know, or they were they had enough freedom so that they could come down and speak, listen, and advocate or oppose. Uh, but I'm I'm not saying that all the people that were here were in support of the the incorporation. There were times when there were the in the incorporation proponents were the minority, and the there were others in the community that had that. Uh, for different reasons, were opposing the incorporation. And it was typically those groups that were somehow affiliated with Sacramento County that were going to lose um, revenue for their programs or their services. Sacramento Deputy Sheriff's Association was afraid that if Citrus Heights Incorporated, that their, the, the, their members would be, some of their members would be laid off. That didn't happen. As a matter of fact, Citrus Heights, when it first incorporated, contracted back to the county for police protection and law enforcement, as did each of the other communities. 
there are a number of private nonprofits. Um, their their, acon their uh, name was Sacramentans to Save Our Services. Um, the symphony, the crocker, um, the ballet, uh, a number of smaller nonprofits out the communities that receive money from Sacramento County to provide a large number of support uh, to their programs. They were opposed because of the fact that they believed that they were going to lose their resources as well. And so, some of them did, but not, not to a significant degree. So there were strong feelings on both sides of the issue. And the reason being is that there hadn't been a new city incorporated in Sacramento County since 1946. So this was a, this was a change in the political structure, the dynamic, the power, um, money. It was in, involved all of those things. Well, that gets back to the, the LAFCO resolution that was adopted, 962B subsection E, where there was a, a technical issue that the county challenged. And as I said before, I don't remember what it was. I don't, I don't, you know, I wouldn't even propose to suggest that I could explain it at this point. Um, but it was a legal issue. And they said, you didn't adopt the resolution in the right manner or whatever the term was in the resolution was incorrect or improper. So they said, we don't have an active resolution, so we're not going to move this thing forward. And so they just, you know, they stalled. And until Van Duker sued, um, and that, you know, that triggered a whole bunch of other activity, lawsuits and challenges and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. Say the, 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 the Citrus Heights battle was, was followed by everybody in the state, every county in the state, um, every city group, every city, as a matter of fact. Uh, the League of Cities got involved, the County Supervisors Association got involved. Everybody had something to lose. If the, if the laws were changed involving the distribution of revenue, which they were through the, you know, the state legislature, that was going to affect every new city that incorporated in the state. Um, if the laws uh, remained the same, every county was going to uh, be adversely impacted by an incorporation like Citrus Heights, where there was an, an, imba an imbalance between the revenue that was generated in that area and the cost of the county providing services. So a lot of different folks were weighing in. Um, it's just, I mean, as I, as I mentioned in, uh, when we you know, met earlier in the week, um, this had national attention. It, you know, it, it ended up in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, Citrus Heights, you know, the, the incorporation issues there. And it was a length, lengthy story. Um, legal, uh, the legal community was following it as well uh, because the implication of um, changing the vo voting uh, geography from the isolated city, proposed city, to a much bigger area had ramifications for other issues where there was voting involved. So um, yeah, had the Supreme Court chosen to take the case and had they ruled differently, we'd, we'd be a very, very different country at this point if, you know, if that had happened. So yeah, it was, it was a big deal. As I was just saying that, you know, one of my best friends was the lobbyist for Sacramento County, Baxter Culber, and uh, he and I had been friends for a long, long time. And we found ourselves, uh, you know, diametrically opposed on how this should all unfold. And I said, uh, again, uh, the, the county was very clever in how it um, raised challenges to um, the incorporation, you know, the one was on the revenue issue and changing the state law. The other was through the county council's office, um, through the various legal challenges, you know, the technical challenge on that LAFCO resolution 962B to the questions of a, abuse of authority in terms of approving an incorporation that was going to, you know, hurt the rest of the county to the to the CEQA issue, to the, the voting rights and voting geography. All of that was, they were very, very slick and unexpected moves on the part of Sacramento County. 
Um, and as I was also saying, it, it caused me to learn how to be very nimble on my feet and react in the moment and in spite of some significant adversity on behalf of those that didn't want to see this happen, to figure out how to make sure that the process, at least from my perspective, remained fair and equitable for uh, the people of Citrus Heights, the people of Rancho Cordova, the people of Elk Grove. Um, it was a challenge at best, and there were times when, like others, I wanted to just say, I wanted to say, I'm out of here. I don't want to do any more of this. And I, at one point, I went to the county executive, the then county executive, Brian Richter, and I said, Brian, you know what? If, if I'm personally attacked anymore by uh, certain members of the opposition group, I'm out of here. You're going to have to find somebody else to do this job. And frankly, I don't think you will, especially the way that I'm doing it. So yeah, uh, I learned a lot. I grew a lot. Um, I have. Uh, I have memories that are both good and bad about the process, but uh, when the dust settles, I'm glad I hung in there, and I'm glad that it turned out the way that it did because it was important not only for Sacramento, uh, the, you know, the, the citizens of Sacramento that uh, wanted to move forward wherever they might be, but also statewide, and it, it, was, it, it had national implications as well. How do I feel? I'm so glad I'm not here anymore. <laughs> Seriously. I spent hours and hours and hours in this room. And you know, the job, the job was eight to five, but it was never eight to five. It was eight, eight to eight, or eight to 10, or eight to 12. And then even when I left, it was still there hanging over me. So yeah, it was a, I had my outlets at the time, but uh, I was still was living and breathing and um, you know just reacting to what I had to do at work and uh, yeah, it was uh, good and bad times. <laughs>